In this video, we're going to build on our knowledge and learn how to calculate stock returns using some real world data. Just a quick recap though, recall that we said that the general equation to calculate the return on a stock is this beauty right here, or alternatively, you can work with this equation. And of course, this is the equation for a return on a stock that pays dividends, so for a dividend paying stock. If you want to calculate the return on a non dividend paying stock, you can still use this formula because the div t plus one would just be equal to zero. So this would simplify to pt plus one over pt minus one. Going forward, I'm gonna assume that you're quite comfortable and quite happy with this equation and that you understand how it works and why it works the way it does. Just one last thing before we use this with real world data, remember that you can always use alternative notations as long as you're consistent with what you're doing. Right, so to start with, we said that the return on a stock J is equal to PT plus one plus div T plus one over PT minus one. Um, but equally, you can define it as PT plus div T over PT minus one minus one, right? So either of these two are fine, as long as you're consistent with the one you're going with. Because if you notice here, PT plus one is one day forward and PT would be one day or one time period before, and similarly here, PT is, you know, one time period ahead of PT minus one. So either notation works as long as you're consistent with it. All right, let's go ahead now and apply this formula with some real world data. So here we are in the Jupyter Notebook. And the first thing we're gonna do is import some packages or libraries or modules, whatever you want to call them. So we're gonna import pandas as PD because we're gonna be dealing with some data. And so pandas will make dealing with that data significantly easier. We're also gonna do a little bit of plotting. So we're gonna import matplotlib.pyplot as PLT. And just because we want our plots to look nice, we're gonna import seaborn as SNS and then say SNS.set. And all this is gonna do is it's gonna make our plots look a lot nicer uh, than if we didn't have sns.set. So these two aren't exactly um, necessary. So you can just uh, work with uh, pandas and matplotlib for this particular video. But if you do want your charts to look nice, then uh, I would recommend importing these two as well. So we're just gonna hit shift enter to run that. And then all of our modules or packages are now um, imported. Uh, and then we're gonna read in the data. So we're gonna say df is equal to pd.read underscore csv. Um, and the data that we're after is this CSV file called um, fb underscore price dot CSV. Um, now the way I've organized my data is um, like this. So I've got a master folder called IAPM underscore Python. And then I've got a folder for data uh, wherein is the um, Facebook underscore price dot CSV file. Uh, and the Jupyter Notebook is in the code folder. So this is the um, Jupyter Notebook that we're working with right now. Uh, and so the way we can import this file that's in the data folder um, is to say dot dot, which is essentially just gonna take the directory to here. Um, so right now we're in the code directory and by dot dot forward slash, we're essentially gonna go back to this directory right here. So the master, folder if you like. Um, and then we're gonna say we wanna go into the data folder and read in the file called fb underscore price dot csv. Now, if this file um, is stored in the same directory as your Jupyter Notebook, then you can just put in this, so just fb underscore price dot csv, and that will read in the file. If on the other hand, it's stored somewhere else, then you'll need the full path as well as the file name uh, over here to then read in the file and save it as a data frame um, object, which in our case, we're just calling df. Um, okay, so if I run that, then if we call df.head, we can see the data that we're dealing with. So we've got date, open, high, low, close, adjusted close, and volume. For this purpose, i.e. to calculate returns, we only really need the adjusted close column uh, and we also want to have the date just so we know um, sort of which dates we're dealing with. Right, so of all these columns, we only need the date column as well as the adjusted close column. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna select these two columns uh, and ignore all the others. And to do that, we're gonna say df is equal to df, uh, and we're gonna open two square brackets, and then we're gonna say date, the column date, as well as adjusted close, um, and then once I hit shift enter, what's gonna happen is it's gonna take the current df, um, 
it's going to select the date column and the adjusted close column um, and it's going to essentially rewrite the df um, data frame object uh, to just include the date and the adjusted close instead of the um, you know all the other columns. So if I just hit shift enter then and call df.head we can see that we now only have the date and the adjusted close which is precisely what we need. Now the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to rename the um, column names. So we're going to say df.rename and we want to rename the columns uh, and we're going to say columns equal to, so we're going to say the date column should just be the date column but in lower case um, and we're going to say the adjusted close column um, we want that to be named as price underscore t because that's the price at time t because all of these are just different price points at different um, times or t's. Um, okay and we're going to say we want that to remain in place so we're going to say in place is equal to true um, and if I now hit shift enter and call df.head then we can see that the columns are now uh, renamed like so. So we have a date column and a price underscore t column. Okay, so with that basic sort of data cleaning done, we're now ready to go ahead and calculate our uh, returns. Now there's two ways in which you can calculate the returns on Python, one of which is relatively more tedious and painful and the other is uh, relatively easier. Now, of course, it's important for you to know how to do both. So I'm going to show you how to do it in the painful way first, uh, and then I'll show you how to do it in the relatively less painful or relatively easier way. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create another column for the price at time t minus 1. So to do that, we're going to say df and open brackets price at time t minus 1. Um, and so what this is going to do is it's going to create a new column called price of time t minus 1 and store it in this data frame df. And we're going to say this column is equal to the df price at time t dot shift 1. And so what this is going to do is it's going to take the individual uh, values in the price underscore t column and it's going to move them or shift them uh, by one index, right? So let me just run this and then call df.head and you'll see exactly what I mean. Um, so if you see the price underscore t column, then we can see that this value of 38.23 uh, is at index zero. And in the price underscore t minus one column, uh, we can see that the same value there is at index one, right? So similarly, 34.029999 is at index one in the column price underscore t and the same value is at index two in the price underscore t minus one column. So basically all we've done is we've lined up the price of time t and the price of time t minus one so that when we want to calculate the returns using the manual approach, what we can say essentially is the returns is the price of time t divided by the price of time t minus one uh, minus one which of course is our equation to calculate um, returns. Now just for clarity, I'm going to put these in parentheses. We don't need to put them in parentheses. It doesn't make a difference as far as the um, calculation goes, but you know it's just a little bit easier to read. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to take each and every one of these values um, of you know, price at time t, and we're going to divide it by the values uh, in the same index at price at time t minus 1, uh, and then we're going to subtract 1, right? So it's going to calculate the returns uh, at every single index for every single value. So let's go ahead and run this now. We're going to hit Shift Enter. And now if we call df.head, um, then we'll see a new column called returns underscore manual. And here we can see that we've calculated the returns for every single observation. So on the first day, Facebook had a return of negative 10.9861% or approximately negative 11%. On the second day, it had negative 8.9% and so on and so forth. And obviously, Python has calculated the returns for every single observation. And we can verify this by going for df.tail, which is going to pull up the last five observations. So if I just hit Shift Enter, then we can see that the last five observations also have these um, return uh, calculations. All right, so this is one way of calculating returns. Uh, and this is, in fact, the relatively more tedious and painful approach. Um, the other way you can do it is by using the percent change method uh, that's built into pandas. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create another column 
um, for returns calculated using the percent change method. So we're going to say df returns percent change method um, is equal to df price at time t dot percent underscore change. Uh, and we're going to set the number of periods as one. So what this is going to do is it's just going to calculate the percent change uh, for every single observation in the price underscore t column. So essentially, um, you know, if we turn our attention to the uh, first set of observations here, it's going to take the first observation, um, so 38.23, and it's going to try and divide it by the observation that precedes it, which obviously doesn't exist. So essentially, that's just going to return a nan, just like we have over here. And then for the second observation, it's going to take 34.029999 and it's going to divide it by 38.23 uh, minus 1. So it's literally just going to apply the formula for calculating uh, stock returns, which is nothing but the percent change from you know time t to t plus 1 or from time t minus 1 to time t. So if I just hit shift enter and run this now and call df.head to look at our uh, data frame again, we can see that the uh, return observations here are identical to what we had before, right? And that's ultimately because it is, of course, doing precisely the same thing that we did, um, except that it's a built-in method. And from a code efficiency standpoint, uh, as far as possible, as much as possible, you always want to use the built-in methods uh, rather than you know your custom uh, formulas simply because the built-in methods tend to be a lot more um, optimal uh, and you know better but having said that it's important to know what the built-in methods are doing behind the scenes um, and so now in future if you use the percent change method then you know precisely what python is doing in the background Having said that, I think at least when you're starting out uh, with working with Python, I would recommend doing it manually as far as calculating returns go. Now, you don't need to create the column separately every time you want to calculate returns, right? Because you could just say df uh, returns is equal to df price at time t um, divided by df price at time t dot shift 1 minus 1. Right, and let me just put these in parentheses again, just for clarity, no other reason. Um, and so all this is doing is rather than creating a separate column for the price of time t minus 1, we're just doing this in one line. Right. So if I just hit shift enter to run this now, call df.head, um, then of course the returns column that we've just created has precisely the same values or results as the other two methods that we've looked at before. Okay, so we now know how to calculate returns on Python, but what I want to do actually is show you something more interesting than that. So if we just plot the prices uh, first, uh, and to do that, what we'll need to do first and foremost is to set the index by the date column, um, because if we don't, then the dates will not show up in our plot, right? So we're plotting the prices. Obviously, we want to show the dates because, you know, that's the price of that particular date. And so to make sure that the date shows up in our chart, we just want to set the date column as the index. And to do that, we're going to say df.set underscore index. Uh, we're going to set the date column as the index. And we're going to say we want that to remain in place. So in place is equal to true. Um, hit shift enter. And if we now take a look at df.head, then we can see that the date column is now the um, index. So with the date column set as the index, let's go ahead and plot the prices. So we're going to say df, and we're going to select the price at time t. And we're just going to say we want to plot this. So we can see that we have the prices um, plotted out. But you know the dates look rather messy, and that's just because the figure is a bit small. So I'm just going to say fig size is equal to, let's go with 12 and 8. Um, and so now we have a bigger chart and the dates are you know, a bit more readable. Um, and so if we look at this chart, then the price of Facebook uh, has this sort of nice upward trending line. And it almost looks predictable, right? Because it's um, got this trend, if you like. But the fact of the matter is, despite what anyone might tell you, uh, the prices are simply not predictable. And to see why they're not predictable, let's go ahead now and uh, look at the returns instead of the prices. So we're going to say df returns um, dot plot, and let's go with the same figure size. So fig size uh, is equal to 12 and 8. 
And once I plot this, you're actually going to see something quite interesting indeed. So let's go ahead and plot this. Um, and there you have it, right? So if we look at the returns of Facebook, you can see that the returns on a day-to-day -day basis are just completely random, right? So it goes as high as sort of 30% on one day, or as low as sort of negative 12 and a half odd percent over here, or, you know, 15 odd percent over here, and I don't know, eight odd percent over here. The point is that, you know, regardless of how you look at it, this is a completely random uh, set of returns. And so despite what anyone might tell you, the returns of stocks are simply not predictable, right? And um, you can do this with literally any uh, stock you choose, regardless of which index it's uh, listed on or which country the stock is uh, operating in, it really doesn't matter, right? So if you were to plot out the returns of any stock anywhere in the world for any time period, um, you will get a chart that looks something like this, which demonstrates how the returns of stocks are completely random because they follow what we call a random walk. Importantly, whenever we're investing in stocks, we base our decision on the expected return uh, rather than the realized return because the historic performance of a stock doesn't necessarily predict uh, where it's gonna go in future, uh, right? So given that we're investing for the future, uh, we want to base this uh, decision on something to do with the future and that in fact is the expected return. So we base our investment decision on what we expect the stock to earn us uh, in future uh, rather than relying exclusively on historic returns. Now there's three main ways in which we can do this. So you can calculate the expected return using the stock's historical average return. This is probably the easiest way to do it. But you can also go a little more sophisticated and look at uh, state contingent uh, weighted probabilities, which sounds a lot more fancy than uh, it really is. Lastly, you can also use uh, asset pricing models, for instance, the CAPM or the Capital Asset Pricing Model. We're gonna go over each and every one of these. So over the next few videos, we'll learn how to estimate the expected returns uh, using all three approaches. For now, it's just important that you know and fully understand how to calculate returns. All right, in summary then, we learned that we can calculate returns on Python using two different approaches. The first one involves using the dot shift method where we essentially take the price column uh, and you know shift it forward uh, by one index. So then we can essentially say the returns are the price column divided by the shifted price or the moved price. Um, minus one. So this is basically our formula for returns because it's PT divided by PT minus one minus one. Alternatively, we can work with the dot percent change function or method. And so we essentially say we have a new column called returns, which is just equal to the price column dot percent change one, because it's one period. So it's a one period percent change. Furthermore, we learned that while prices may appear to be deceptively predictable, it's important to know that they're not, and that's ultimately because returns follow what we call a random walk. Last, but certainly not the least, we learned that we base our investment decisions on expected returns, not returns. All right, that's enough from me for now. Have a go at the quiz, and I'll see you in the next video.